Ladies and gentlemen, our next session is Redefining Success with Customer Obsession. Welcome. Hello, New York. How are you? Are you good? I'm Woo. very excited about this panel. Um, you guys know me. I'm Bon and Bao, Chief Strategy Officer and co-founder of Group Black. Um, I spent a lot of time working with all the amazing people on this stage, and so you're in for a real treat here, some of the best in the business. Um, I meant me, but they're also good. Um, so I'll let them introduce themselves without me, and then I'll tell maybe a little personal story about each, but go ahead, Todd, go. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, Todd Kaplan. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Pepsi, uh, and uh, happy to be here. Exciting. Hi, guys. Katie Williams. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Haleon. If you don't know the company, you know our brands, Advil, Tums, Sensodyne, Centrum, all great self-care brands. Hi, Sophie Kelly uh, with Diageo. And look after the, our agave, tequila, mascal category globally. It's fun. Right. Woo! All the stuff that's going to make tonight memorable. Uh, or there forgotten, one or the other. Uh, so, you know, um, again, I, I've had the privilege to work with uh, all three of the people on the stage and truly some of the finest marketers. And the original name of the session was really about customer obsession and to understand, you know, what does that mean? And more importantly, how do you build it? And uh, some of you might know Mark Echo, but I met Mark Echo many years ago, and he said to me, he said, a great brand is something that people are willing to tattoo on their body. And I was like, you're crazy, but you're also right. Uh, and it made me think about people used to get married wearing Mountain Dew outfits. And so it just made me start thinking about what does actual customer obsession actually look like? Um, and so I'm actually going to go to Sophie because you guys, you know, there's so many spirit brands out there. Of course, I'm sure you don't care about the other ones. but. Um, you know, what is customer that are fighting for customer loyalty, but what have you been able to do with the Diageo brands to really create kind of that customer obsession? And I know we talked a little bit about it backstage, but. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm going to refer to uh, my time on whiskey as well at Diageo. But funnily enough, talking about the Mountain Dew, people getting married in their Mountain Dew stuff, I had an experience uh, on one of my favourite whiskey brands, Crown Royal, where I was skiing in Park City and I had a bullet jacket on, like a vest, because uh, that was another one of my favourite brands. And this person came flying past me uh, and was at the back of me and whacked me on the back and said, wrong brand! And I turned around and this guy, I kid you not, was was head to toe ski outfit made out of crown royal bags. So, you know, <laughs> I just I just thought I'd share that and I wish I had the photo to, to, to show you. But um, consumer obsession. Listen, I think we're lucky because most of our brands, it's critical uh, that they play at the moment of celebration, at the moment of connection, at the moment of uh, socialising. And so we're uh, really lucky because we can ride alongside culture if we do it right and create really real connections and real memories and real moments um, that are hopefully not forced but true to where that brand belongs. So for us it's really about, to answer your question, understanding the brand, understanding its values, understanding its role in cultural moments and who it connects with and then creating great memorable experiences that people want to be a part of. And how much of the work that you do in creating customer obsession is based on customer feedback? Customer feedback? That's an interesting question. So what I would say is if you look at something like Bullet and think about how we create what I call fandom for that brand, um, there is multiple levels in our marketing. Most of the feedback, I think, comes through shopper, right, and retailer and uh, customer, actually, versus direct from consumer. We do have brands where we have huge consumer feedback, and I would say Crown Royal is one that really over-indexed on that, and that's because of the attachment and the community uh, engagement in what people do around that brag. But, bag. but if I look at like a brand like Bullet, okay, so it's a frontier whiskey. Um, what did we do? Uh, we create uh, work with creators on the frontier. So if you take a platform like United Masters, we work with JIV to create a film, a big film, which is all about um, what it means to live on the frontier and enjoying that. But then if you go right the way through 
the channels that we activate in. We also have programs like Bullet in Beer, which is all about owning occasion and turns up in the on-premise and at retail with huge display reinforcing our craft credentials and the moment of consumption for the brand. So, you know, it's not a one size fits all and the consumer engagement and consumer feedback is very different depending on the channel that you're connecting them in. So the type of conversations around our brand in social that we're listening to and responding to versus the type of conversations we're getting from right. bartender and trade versus the type of conversations and feedback we're getting from retail. And I think it's important to listen to all of them to understand how to get that real connection and fandom. Right, and you guys have a unique scenario where, yeah, the feedback loop is actually through. The Katie, uh, so consumer marketer um, turned, do I... It's still consumer, but it's more in the healthcare space, and it's about building, I think, a lot, even more trust, because it's something that uh, you know is actually helping some a problem I have, not just getting me drunk, uh, which could be a problem I have. Uh, no, sorry, that's wrong. Uh, anyway, go ahead. So, just what was that first? What's that journey like? And then, kind of, how do you think about customer obsession for your brands? Yeah, it's it's not lost on me that I'm the the healthcare person in between, you know, <laughs> the carbonated beverage and the, and the uh, spirits brands here. But um, I, I spent many years in, um, in food and snacks and, and got to build brands like Sour Patch Kids and Oreos, which was amazing. And then I moved into, um, into to what we call self-care, which is really, it's definitely in the healthcare business, but it really is about you know, consumers being able to advocate for their own health and well-being, and particularly after the last few years, um, everybody is really thinking much more often about it. For us, customer obsession comes first and foremost with efficacy. If, if our products don't work, um, you know, um, when consumers need them most, then can, they're not going to be obsessed. Um, so trusted science married with deep human understanding is where we think our, our um, competitive advantage lies. So how that plays out is on brands like um, Tom's, which people do have them tattooed all over the place. <laughs> but, you know, heartburn isn't all that fun. But, you know, the way the you know, the path to get to heartburn for many people is associated with a lot of those fun moments, eating spicy foods, you know, being pregnant and having, um, you know, um, symptoms related to heartburn because of that, you know, all of these things that are very emotional, um, and celebratory times for people and connecting with that is really what helps brands like Tums becomes a cultural moment to the point where we are able to respond and so with a high school teacher who uses the Tums theme song as their his opening um, uh, exercises for his boys' choir every morning. Do you guys know the Tums theme song? How does it go? Sing it. Sing it. Tum, 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 tum. <laughs> and so every morning he does that with his. And so th those are the kind. That's the kind of love for a brand, even in you know healthcare, self care, that you can create first with that efficacy, but then understanding how people are engaging um, with your brand. And and I love the fact that I can bring what I learned in the true you know fun space like food and snacks, but but bring that sort of attitude and perspective to to self care. Was it a journey and a learning experience? Is it how, yeah. you know, I, I worked in pharma. Yeah. And vastly different, similarly close, but regulatory was the bigger issue in pharma. But I'm yeah. just wondering what your. Yeah. Yeah. So my background, actually, I was a scientist when I started my career. So I was, um, I used to work at, at a company in Cincinnati and I did research for them. And then I discovered marketing while I was there and then said, hey, this is probably, you know, an even better fit for me because I get to decide things and they can happen like immediately. So it is a full circle moment for me because I spent then the next 20 years of my life learning how to build brands and being passionate about that consumer connection. But then I can bring the science to it as well from that background. Um, you know, the reality is we all work in a tremendous amount of constraints. And what I would say is the cool thing about marketers, Haleon is no longer part of a pharma, you know, a parent company. We separated and now we're a standalone consumer health company. And one of the fun things about that, though, is you have a lot of marketers in that organization that had to learn how to build brands right. with a tremendous amount of constraints. Right. So that's their superpower. They already have. They understand. Now we all have constraints, right? Like the supply chain is screwed up. 
you know, the the media market is just like a freaking mess. Like everything. Not at Group Black, by the way. <laughs> Not at Group Black. <laughs> um, and so, but these marketers, they they've had to deal with constraints, you know, their entire career. So we really do have a superpower. And now I'm able to bring to them and other people that have come in from the CPG world that marriage of passionate um, brand building with that sort of beautiful constraint, and it works really well. That's great. You have no constraints. So your job's easy. We got, we got <laughs> lots of constraints. Come on. Well, um, so, so you know, for I was there when they last changed the logo, which now that I see it written on paper was 14 years ago, which scared me even more. But yes. Yeah, so, uh, and I'll tell you the funny thing is when we la when the logo changed, we did an influencer campaign. You might remember this, Todd. We did an influencer campaign where we sent, I think it was 23 logos at that time. What number of logos is this? 20. It's a lot. Right. Yeah. So anyway, so there was a lot of logos. So we sent a bunch of cans that we had reprinted to influencers, and then we had the drivers waiting, the uh, deliver, waiting to then deliver the new logo once we announced it to the world. And one of the influencers um, kept it, kept the, the series that we did, and um, you know, in our anyway, kept the series that we did, and emailed me like three years ago and said thank you because he kept them and he found them and he put them online and he was able to sell them for like six grand because they were official because Pepsi had actually done them so they were official. So there's two things. One, I want to know what was it like to go you through that journey? That and two, <laughs> do you have any of those left? But you also ruined yeah. the price for the. <laughs> so, so yeah. So um, in case uh, you didn't know, we just recently announced that we've, uh, we've changed the Pepsi logo and new visual identity system moving forward. And, uh, it's a project that's been, um, you know, a labor of love uh, for me over the last three and a half, four years. And these things do not come easy and, and overnight. And, um, you know, and it's one of those things, too. You talk about being obsessed with your consumers. Uh, it is something that, as you think about the onus, this is a 125-year-old brand that um, the stakes, if you screw that up, right? Like, I mean, holy, sh holy crap, right? Like, you want to you wanna get it right. And one of the real insights that we learned when we were uh, trying to decide what to do with it, how do we want it to look, what do we want to do, is we started talking to consumers and we said, draw the Pepsi logo uh, without any constraints. And what we found is a lot of consumers would draw the word Pepsi inside of the logo, almost like a throwback to one of the, you know, a couple logos ago. And Pepsi as a, such an old brand is, you know, it's always been updated with the times and the current, you know, young brand. And so um, every like 15 or so years, we, we do good hygiene and kind of update things. And so it's been about 14 years. And so we've decided to roll it out, but it, um, it's something that throughout the entire process, you know, it's been multiple testing and getting feedback and, and going through it all. And so as we've now rolled it out, it's, um, again, it's going to take a couple of years to fully roll it out. I think there's about 10 billion touch points we have to touch between fountains and trucks and signs and cups and all sorts of fun stuff that you can only uh, imagine. But yeah, and then I, I can't speak to the, uh, the influencer can or anything like that that uh, you're talking to. I'm not as familiar with that one. But yeah, there's always, the second you come out with something new, then the vintage thing is always a good throwback. And it's a, it's a nice, you know, connect. And especially a lot of our consumers are our biggest kind of brand fans out there geek out over a lot of that stuff for sure. So, you know, it's a... Uh it's interesting because by the time you're done rolling it out, you'll probably be ready to change it again. So that, probably, probably, but, you know. And some people uh, think we didn't even change the last one because we're still <laughs> we're still converting on that. Right, right. Um, uh, so you know, Katie was there during uh, when the Oreo logo changed, which I, I think people don't realize when the Oreo shifted to a smile. If you look at the Oreo now, it's it's literally went from the show the whole cookie to like a, a smile underneath it, which actually. You know, it's actually the cookie coming off the cream a little bit, right. showing a little smile. <laughs> Sorry. Insider. Marketers. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but some people the love details, their cookies. Right? Some people love their right. cream. Right. <laughs> so, but I was going to go, because that was also our 100th anniversary, and that was, it was a very important moment for Oreo to get right as well. You guys are 125, so what has... What has this been like? Yeah, it's it's kind of crazy when you think about 125 right. years. And so just earlier on August 28th was our 125th <laughs> birthday. And it sounds crazy saying that out loud because Pepsi, like I said, has always been a brand with pop culture. It's a youthful brand. It's kind of energetic. And it is old as all hell. It came around in 1898, right? And so the story of Caleb Bradham starting it in a pharmacy and, you know, and what we learned is we went through a lot of this process. We had a big celebration with our company and whatnot, but, you know, there's a lot of things that as you think about a brand, and Pepsi is definitely a legacy brand, it's a two-sided coin, right? Because this idea of legacy, a legacy is a very 
were the important thing, like, okay, what's your legacy? What are you famous for? People would identify with something, but then also legacy has this potential to be tired and old and associated with an older time from yesteryear. And so how do you keep it fresh? And so a lot of the things that we've done as we look to activate, not just with the new logo, but as we've activated this brand over the years is stay true to our heritage, which is really about Pepsi's a challenger brand in its real DNA and always challenging convention. It's associated with pop culture and, uh, and a lot of these big moments and stuff, whether it's with music and sports and and uh, and a lot of these things. And so we've done a whole lot of stuff to celebrate our 125th. Um, we're creating actually a, a Pepsi 125 diner in Manhattan that'll come about uh, next month. That'll be literally almost like a Planet Hollywood meets Pepsi, celebrating all these kind of fun, great moments from the past, some of our culinary kind of creations and whatnot. Um, we even brought back some of our old, uh, you know, spots on the Video Music Awards. Pepsi's actually credited uh, with inventing lifestyle marketing back when we partnered with Michael Jackson in the 80s. We were the first brand to turn a TV commercial into a music video and how we'd partner with a lot of these artists. We actually invented the radio jingle years ago back when the radio came about. And there's all these firsts we learned about it. But so to celebrate that on the night where they're celebrating Video Music Awards, we brought back our uh, Britney Spears spot and Ray Charles spot and all these fun spots, even the Madonna one that we only aired for a day before it was kind of, you know, it was banned and there was a whole bunch of controversy around it. But uh, really kind of going back and what we found is consumers today reintroducing those to consumers who didn't, hadn't even seen these things, didn't even understand it. Um, you know, it was a great way to kind of pull that that brand love through line, you know, through a lot of our activations. And we'll do a lot more like that just to celebrate as we continue to look forward. I mean, and some of it's legacy that creates consumer obsession and it's the length of time. And, you know, you know, I often say people forget how important brands are in people's lives. So if you think about like Levi's, you know, that meant freedom to some people. Pepsi was the choice of a new generation, meant that I could, you know, and we forget that they're the characters that are part of the stories of our lives. Um, but also sometimes consumer obsession, Sophie, is created in very short periods of time. So in the spirits industry, we've seen the proliferation of new brands at a much faster pace that have been able to create kind of that consumer obsession. Just talk a little bit about what your experience has been with kind of the, the emergent brands and then how do you maintain obsession with some of the more legacy, as he said, brands. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a great point, right? So look at tequila. Like, everybody's got a tequila. Everybody's got a tequila. I got, got one, one if you need They're it. Coming. I mean, way. if you look at the whiskey category since 2015 to now, about uh, 1,500 new brands came into it in, in North America, craft whiskey brands. And That's that, extraordinary, right? In 10 years, you said? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Now, you look at tequila, about 800 have come in in the last 18 months. Right? So wow. you're dealing with talking about trying to get disproportionate uh, love, affection, obsession. What's the trick? Um, well, I'll tell you about it in a couple of years on tequila. Anyway, no, joking. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, I think uh, uh, understanding who your brand is, what you stand for, uh, where you play in occasions and what values and who you're trying to recruit is super important um, and being authentic about how you activate. So I'm going to go to uh, a really, really old brand that hopefully all of you know that's one of my favorite whiskey brands, Johnny Walker, right? That's an amazing brand. How uh, old is Johnny Walker? Just curious. Uh, it's about. like over 200 years old, wow. right? And He's got nothing on Johnny. There yeah. you go. Yeah. So... And, you know, in a particular day, it was all about uh, whiskey ritual, which was very much masculine and um, a, a certain kind of moment, right? Um, one of our tasks over the last kind of 10 years has been to take the meaning of Johnny Walker, which Scotch is a brand that turns up when you've achieved something, you know? It's one of those things you reach for to congratulate yourself for a high, high reward, right? So it tended to sit on the pedestal until it was time for it to be, you know, worthy of being bought out. We had to break some of that stuff. And, you know, the, the idea behind the brand is keep walking. It stands for progress. So what does that mean today? So that gave way to us connecting in culture and doing things in sport like sponsoring Angel City Football Club, which is all about women's soccer, um, bringing our influencers engaged in the brand like Brittany Howard and Tia P together to create kind of uh, the first ever female soccer sports anthem. So uh, 
you know, I mean, the reason why I talk about this is when you think about uh, 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 categories that have a high amount of attention from consumers that are playing with a lot of influencers and a lot of celebrities, being true to understanding what your brand does, where it turns up, and the meaning behind the brand, and then still activating in cultural moments that push that meaning forward is really important. So for Johnny Walker, kind of we put an, a brand new kind of release of life on it when we let the icon off the loose, uh, off the leash and stopped keeping it so stuffy. We said progress has to be about more than just one dimensional progress. You can actually celebrate progress in every day. And then you can't be about progress without talking about gender equality. So what does that mean for how we activate in culture? And then we went about uh, with our first strides campaign and doing sport in a different way. I, I mean, you take crown, that's a complete flip of it, right? That's about generosity. Uh, it's about game day. It's about the NFL. But we still turn up in a way which is packing bags for the military at games, you know, which is true to the DNA of what Crown stands for. So I think, you know, if you're going to continue to be big and grow and relevant and obsessed by consumers, you have to be really true to what your brand is, who you're talking to, and evolving that brand promise in culture in a way that's relevant. So, Katie, I um, and I usually never just go down the line. I realize I was going down the line, but uh, bad moderation over here. So, Katie, you know, you've meant you brought up, you mentioned two brands that I had a chance to see kind of from the inside. And what I think is really interesting about both of those brands is they they both had challenge stories that probably most people wouldn't realize, but on different ends of the spectrum. So, Oreo. I would joke and say it was about to become irrelevant. Not necessarily it was about to become irrelevant, but it hadn't changed the TV spot in 40 years. I mean, it was Twist, Lick, and Donk, Mom and Kid, and we reached every 6 to 12-year-old and anybody who owned a 6 to 12-year-old. So, And they just don't get made fast enough, you know? So that we had to move that brand up to a millennial consumer, create snacking moments, which really catapulted Oreo into a growth business, which it really wasn't before. And Sour Patch Kids had a similar problem when you got to it, which was it was a relatively stagnant brand, and it kind of went, I joke, from candy to culture. It, you know, people putting it in music videos, and like you were able to connect both of these brands to back to the cultural zeitgeist. How do you do that now, or is that not? Yeah. No, I mean, it, it's so, I think in healthcare, you do it differently. Um, but there's obviously... I, mean, I thought it was self-care. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. Um, you do it differently, but I think it's in the context of the broader healthcare, right? So healthcare is incredibly complex. And what we all learned, I think, during the last three years is there's an incredible amount of inequity um, in it as well. And not everyone has the ability to access um, healthcare, um, in the way that they should. And it creates disparities and outcomes for many, many people. And so we are not 200 or 125 years old. We are 14 months old. And um, as a company, what that gave us is the opportunity when we spun off from our parent pharma company to decide who we wanted to be and what kind of impact we wanted to have on the world and then how we could bring that to life through our brands. And for us as a company, it's important to deliver everyday health with humanity. And that starts with making healthcare more inclusive. And so we are able to connect our brands like Advil, where we recognize there's an incredible amount of inequity as, as it comes to the treatment of pain, particularly around black and brown people. Working with Morehouse College, and Black Health to put a program together that's educating the next generation of healthcare providers and doctors on what pain equity is like and how they can ensure that when they go out in the world and they're treating patients, they recognize that it's important to treat the whole patient. Centrum is a brand, you talk about new entrants. We have brands like, or categories like pain where it is, the, the barriers to entry are incredibly high. So you have you know, us and you know, a couple others that I won't mention. Um, um, and and that just let everybody know what us is. Which one is us? Advil. Okay, just I want to make sure. Advil, Excedrin, and Voltaren are is in our pain portfolio. So absolutely, if you need any of those, please make sure you go out and get them. <laughs> um, but. Um, but then we, I also have a vitamins, minerals, is, and supplements category, which talk about new entrants. I mean, there's new entrants every day. Can you th think about all the supplements that you guys have seen on the market and the new spaces in that? And we have a brand Centrum that, you know, many people would have said, 
it's not going to really be able to survive in this environment. You know, it is it is considered to be something that's for people 50 and older, and for some reason that means it's no longer relevant. Um, <laughs> and and it's you know it's not you know branded in the way that some of these you know lifestyle um, brands are. But Centrum, what it does have is it has superior efficacy that's rooted in science. It was started um, to support um, cancer patients because they needed vitamin supplementation during their treatment. And so we went back to that and said, how do we really understand what are the things that are important to our consumers? Well, we understood that now what people are thinking about is their um, mental acuity as they age. We did a clinical study with an external um, academic partner that proved that Centrum Silver, so you guys listen to this because you're going to be buying it now, um, <laughs> proved that Centrum Silver, when taken every day, will slow down the degradation of your cognitive health as you age. And I. Yeah. So that means you can remember more. Your executive functioning skills are better than people that don't take that multivitamin. That in a, in a category, so what we did is we went, as soon as we got that clinical information, we went out, we talked about it, we shouted it from the rooftops, and the Centrum brand is outgrowing any of these new players right now because at the end of the day, what people really at the, give a damn about is, am I going to remember my kid's face, right. you know? 20 years from now? Am I going to remember, you know, how to freaking open the refrigerator and make myself a snack? And if Centrum can give them that confidence, then that's what really matters. So that's that combination of trusted science and deep human understanding that we bring to our brands. I, I mean, I always love talking to you. So look, we got one minute and 10 seconds, lightning round. What's your superpower? My superpower is inclusiveness. I have brought, I've always found a way to help people understand. I come from an incredibly diverse family, multiple languages, multiple races, multiple religions, multiple economic status. I've lived in that, I grew up in that. I know how to unlock the power of diversity and inclusion for growth. Not everybody knows how to do that, and it's incredibly important in this marketplace. Um, and so I do that with my teams, I do that with my agency partners, I do that with my brands, and I create an environment where inclusivity thrives and drives growth on your business. I think that's the big conversation is driving growth, and I think that that's really the only place you're gonna source growth. How are you gonna beat that, Todd? Go. <laughs> Superpower? Yeah. I'd say um, agility. Um, in today's world where you know culture changes on a dime and things are not always what they seem, and you gotta, you know, the typical brand planning process and all that stuff, you gotta be on your toes and move on a dime, and I think the, the way we operate with our teams and our agencies uh, reflects that, and I think, um, you know, always land on our feet. You also have one which you talk about, which is the create, create collaborativity. Sure, yeah. Many, right. many superpowers. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. Calm down, no, Marvel. No, like, <laughs> then, yeah. But yes, uh, how, we, how we collaborate with our, our partners. Right. And, yeah, and I had to do it. intro him to the, the United Jewish Association, which I was like, I don't know why. And you know what? He had a video. Guess who was in the video? Shaq. I'm like, so why did you call Bonin, man, if he had Shaq? All right, Sophie, hey. go. Yeah, hey. Uh, Bring us home. Love all of yours. Mine is inspiring the dreamer in everyone. So I reckon that marketing is about finding growth where other people can't see it. And in order to do that, you have to live in possibility and dream. So giving my teams the safe space to dream. Love, I love that. That's a good way to close. Everybody, let's give a huge round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you.